the world-renowned pianist Jan Lyshetsky. Recently, Jan joined me for a conversation about the creative process and genius behind the cadenzas of the Beethoven Piano Concerti, and then he performed each one for us all to relish. It gives me great pleasure to welcome Jan Lyshetsky. Jan, thank you so much for joining us to discuss the Concerti of Beethoven, or at least the cadenzas of the Concerti of Beethoven, which I think is such a fascinating idea. And welcome back, because I think you were just in Germany recently. That's right. I am on my last day of quarantine. I'm very glad about that. It makes it a perfect chance to talk and to take your mind off of the fact that you are confined to your house. And I'm very privileged, of course, because this is my house, this is my piano. I have a nice view. Uh, it's green outside, it's summer. It's fine. Well, we're the ones who feel privileged to be invited into your house and I appreciate that very much. And it's great also that you went to Germany and actually played some live concerts for a small audience. So that's uh, something we hope to see soon in, uh, in this country. But in the meantime, let's talk a little bit about the cadenza in general. Tell us, the cadenza comes usually at the end of, let's talk just about the first movements. Tell us a little bit about your feeling about cadenzas. Well, I think the role of the cadenza developed quite a bit. And of course, Beethoven being the revolutionary composer, the revolutionary person he was, he, he took it into a different dimension than it was. But let's say in a Mozart concerto, there was always a spot after uh, all the thematic material was presented in the exposition, then developed, and then shown again in the recapitulation. Then there was a big tutti and a cadenza. And the cadenza is essentially a cadence, a 5-1 cadence, dominant tonic, just a sort of statement. But, of course, this, that's just a springboard for going on an improvisational, virtuosic uh, sort of tangent, completely off somewhere into a different direction, using the theme uh, or the themes or the material from the concerto that has been shown before. And showing that theme, showing that repertoire that, that you've already played in that concerto in a different way was one of the things that soloists at the time were expected to improvise. They were supposed to come to the stage, play the concerto as a composer had intended, had written it, and then make up the cadenza on the spot. Of course, things have changed quite drastically today. Uh, I'm thankful because I am very happy to be playing, for example, Beethoven's cadenzas for these concertos. Uh, but the role of the cadenza in these, this piece and these works that we're discussing today is still very much the same. It's about presenting the material in a solo virtuosic form on the piano, presenting the pianist ability, presenting the, the music in a different light. But also it presents the imagination of the, of the composer because up until this time, any, at the time of Beethoven, any uh, performer would improvise on the spot their own cadenza. And what's so fascinating about having these cadenzas of Beethoven is that we see kind of what might have been in his mind as an improviser. Um, and th I think that the elements, that you talk a little bit about how they take material uh, and themes and transform them and, and develop them and maybe make variations on them. But there are sort of other elements to it. It's a chance to really show off, right? So there are passages that are pure virtuosity, right? And, and then there are passages which have to be transitions to get from one thematic group to another thematic group. Let's start with the second concerto because it was written first. Why not? Absolutely. Let's uh, do it. How about we hear the main theme, themes of the, of the concerto? Okay, well, we have, I think, basically essentially one main theme of this concerto, actually, because the second theme is a development of the first theme, which is interesting. So we have... B major chord, split, put played together, and then split. And that's very simple, very, very simplistic and pure and elegant. But what, what can you do from this? Next part of the theme. There is, though, a second theme that or at least that's a secondary theme. Let's, yeah. let's hear that. So now let's talk about how he starts this cadenza, because usually you would act, at least hear one of the themes in its original form. But in this cadenza, how does it start? Well, he takes this original chord that he starts with, B flat major. But instead of going from the top, he goes from the bottom. And 
it starts only in the left hand. And that's incredibly unusual because, I mean, we're used to, even as pianists, yes, we use both our hands, we use the whole range of the piano, but generally thematic material, especially when it's being presented, is in the right hand. It's in the soprano voice. It's the more natural place for a melody to be shown. And here it's not, it's in the bass. It's like everything is flipped. He decided to put it upside down. Upside down and in the wrong hand, as it were. It's like a foil for you expecting some virtuosity to happen. And the first thing that happened is only single notes. And also that dotted rhythm of that descending scale, the second thing you played, is just a dotted version of that descending scale from is that kind of idea, right? That's an idea of, that, that we, we see over and over again in these cadenzas, how something is subtly changed and developed. But this is also rather strange because it has, it continues in a kind of contrapuntal where the voices are independent, right? You talk about, you know, there's a lot of harmonic playing, of course, but here we have, it's more or less all what we call contrapuntal. Give us a little bit more of an idea of, 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 the, of the first few bars of the cadenza. And it goes on developing that basic idea. Basically. If you heard that, and you didn't know what it was. We Bach. Think, yeah, Bach, absolutely. Yes. Bach inspired a lot of people and continues to. Um, good. Okay, so t take us through, we have that contrapuntal passage goes on for quite a while. What's yeah, the next, yeah. next important event in this cadenza? So then we have, after many harmonic changes and development, he goes, ending obviously quite dramatically in forte, but then, That's a genius part of the cadenza, is these drastic surprises, that those harmonic changes that you could not, that could not take place in a standard structured form of the movement that preceded the cadenza. And yet, and now he's developing not a completely new theme, just that, that response theme. Da -dee -da 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 -dee -da That's... <laughs> shock, and then he takes this and continues. And that's what, where the line between development of thematic material and virtuosity is very blurred, because it, he takes it, of course, you can recognize the basic concept, but it's turned into something drastic, majestic, powerful, virtuosic. Just sometimes, in some cases, it's just a place to show off. And in fact, he's taken a very lyrical theme made yep. it twice as fast, and then opens the door for virtuosity, which then continues uh, for, a, for a while. And where do we go after that? Well, after that, we reach, again, a fantastic harmonic progression in this dotted rhythm that we have. Once again, we're back into virtuoso. So it, it's constantly evolving, constantly shaping. And the, the point that we didn't discuss earlier is that a cadenza, even when it's written down, even when we just have an idea of what Beethoven was trying to show uh, as a virtuoso, it still should feel to the audience as if it were invented, improvised on the spot. And that's my role as a musician, not to make it so structured, not to make it so firm, not so, to make it so obvious, to really relish those surprises, those uncertainties that we don't know where it's going to go next. Uh, but somehow we know, the only thing we know is that it has to somehow end in the right key and finish the concerto. But otherwise, everything's possible. At the end, then, we have a surprising thing, I think, is that it resolves into the home key, which cadenzas are not supposed to do. They're supposed to sort of end in the, in the, in the dominant and not give you the arrival into the tonic, but this we have a very elaborate tonic. It's a very, it's like a pedal point, very long, extended over half a page, and it's on this trill in the bass, which is 
uh, gives us uncertainty to it because normally if you have a pedal point it's on one note you have an idea but here with this dissonance from the a below the b flat it, it makes it feel as if he doesn't know where he's going Incredible virtuosity, and you better be happy with the conductor that he brings the orchestra in at the right. <laughs> Fantastic. That's wonderful. Well, thank you so much. That's so fascinating. Let's hear the condenser. <laughs> Thank you so much. Let's move to this, the concerto written second, which is known as the first concerto. Um, and this is the longest of all the cadenzas, I believe. It's well over five minutes. It's insane. And it's a long first movement too. It's not, it's not that he didn't develop the thematic material in the movement. The movement is quite developed already. And I, I think it, it's probably the longest cadenza I've ever played in any work that I, I know of. Uh, it, it takes you on such a journey. Um, so th he does something really wonderful at the beginning of this one too. Uh, to maybe take, give us the material though first, because it's always nice to hear the themes for everyone. Absolutely. That is the most beautiful beginning. C major, just a basic C major chord with an octave. And that octave theme, so simplistic, and it's a theme, it's an idea, it's a musical concept. It's amazing what he could come up with. Isn't it? Something between a statement and a question. You never really know which it is. Exactly. So, 
so so elegant, so proud somehow. And just going on this uh, basic key of C major, a very elemental and very pure and simplistic. And he uses this so much then through the cadenza that we'll be talking about. It's crazy how just a basic octave leap of the same note can be developed so drastically. Amazing. So, so now give us any, uh, some other thematic material that, that he's going to develop in the cadenza. Let's see. Uh, so we have... Beautiful, elegant theme. That's our second theme. Um, and so I think very early on in this cadenza, he brings in a really virtuosic character, would he you does. say? Yes. Yeah. And, and also gives us uh, situations from which we can go almost anywhere. Like this idea of using diminished chords, which allow one to go anywhere. They're very useful for transitions, rather like chromatic scales when you play all the black and white notes. You can sort of go into a lot of different areas in that. And he uses that throughout the cadenzas, of course. Um, but tell us the, the, the next event that you'd like to talk about in, the, in this first cadenza. Well, I think I'd like to start from the very beginning. He takes this octave theme. Okay. Major, but we don't know the key because it's just the C. We just hear, and then the right hand comes with the D, which is right away this dissonance. Just building on this idea and a scale going down. So so simple and so effective. And the next thing he does is he gets another idea of how to use the scale going down. Yes. Okay. In thirds, now in sixths. There's the diminished chord I'm talking about, which is uh, petrifying actually at that moment. Yes. But and he just makes these diminished chords and then puts it into a huge virtuoso passage. This whole, th this beginning of the cadenza, the sort of the introduction to the cadenza on this basic theme lasts over well over two pages. <laughs> so no wonder it takes five minutes to play the whole cadenza. And now he revis revisits those thirds going down. So. that basic thing, and then another huge passage, another huge passage, don't have to play them all. <laughs> of course, we will hear them in a minute. <laughs> okay, and this, so this is all just huge virtuosity, right, Th uh, throughout the bit, using that octave jump uh, uh, tremendously. And so that, so that goes on for quite a while. What's the next sort of development moment, the next fascinating moment in your view? I think the next interesting moment is how he takes this octave theme and uh, once again, using diminished, it's not necessarily chords, but diminished um, intervals, how he moves the theme once again. It's the same idea, but instead of having the leap, it's, it's compacted, it's put together on the same note and, and just taken, stretched, Augmented. It's, it's so fantastic because the purity of the initial statement is so simple and now suddenly with all of these suspensions it has incredible tension, something that it was very much not intended to have at the beginning. No. So uh, a, a great example of a, of a complete transformation of an idea. Um, okay. And out of this, <laughs> I mean, it speeds it up, actually, the idea. And yet, the feeling is so much calmer, such beauty, such yearning in the characters. It's, it's extraordinarily magical, 
what he's capable of doing by, in a way, by doing the opposite of what you would expect to have to happen. Okay, so then we get one of these scale passages, which is a classic transition. Yes, and that's one thing about scales generally. Scales and trills, and especially chromatic scales, are great for transitioning things and cadences, aren't they? Fantastic. And so there's our second theme. It, very pure, right? Very pure, D flat major, simple. Absolutely. And the thing is that he then transforms it into the enharmon enharmonic minor key, which is C sharp minor, which is very Ex extraordinary. Uh, and remember, the, we have to keep in mind this is a piece in C major. Exactly. <laughs> so then we've just heard this theme. I'll play it just. Beautiful and charming and, and sweet, but then we hear so, so painful suddenly. And then he takes his basic idea of this um, two note step that he has, da -dum, da -dum, and he takes it into the next idea that he is. Does that come from anywhere? Just from Beethoven's brain? The thing is, of course, in music, patterns exist everywhere. So if you really want to hyper-analyze everything, you'll always find a place that it can come from. So. Absolutely. But the left hand that you're about to play just after that. That is from the principal material. Absolutely. So then we get to the, I mean, it's already pretty very virtuosic and pretty furious, but then he really arrives at a very angry moment. So we've taken this, once again, I'll play the beginning of the theme. C major, elegant. Two. for quite a while once again. Absolutely. And all of this virtuosity then suddenly unwinds in a very beautiful way and he does something which perhaps is intended to be witty, perhaps is just intended to open a door for something else, which is that he gives with the tr us the trills that would suggest we reached, we've reached the end of the cadenza. Absolutely, of course. <laughs> Not meant to be, is it? And that's another part of the thematic material that he uses in the cadenza. This little march. Yeah. yeah. The last thing you expect after all of that fury, by the way. I think this is a, the one cadenza that gives off the most this improvisational aspect of Beethoven's writing. Because it has so many contrasting, unexpected changes, and, and some would say illogical. It comes together in the end. Right. And he, but, but he uses the same trick right after this that he used earlier, because you have da, ba, 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 and he's going to change that to did a little, little, little. Right? Exactly. So suppress it and make another insane passage out of it. Virtuoso interlude once again. Getting just, just the same kind of shape, but getting faster and faster each time. Yeah. Uh, and then we have, of course, another chromatic scale so that he can go where he needs. Exactly. Uh, just big chromatic scale. the cadenza could end here and we would have a little passage ending and you could come in but no it's not meant to be either 
but he's also teasing us because he's giving us the first theme, but without the first note. Yep. So, and, and then we come to the most wonderful and surprising ending, I think. It's the, this is one of the most witty things uh, in all of the cadenzas, the ends of any of the cadenzas of Beethoven. If you recall the ending of the second concerto's cadenza, it was just a scale and just a passage where the orchestra has to come in on the very last note. And in this, in a sense, it's the same thing here because we have the scale, but instead of getting that last note together, it's a little different. <laughs> And then the orchestra comes in once again with this basic and very simple march. Yum. After this whole five minute cadenza, and it ends very quickly. He doesn't really dilly daddle in ending the, ending the movement, which is amazing. Incredible. That's fantastic. Thank you so much. Beautiful. Let's hear it. Absolutely.
beautiful, Jan. Thank you so much. All right, let's move on to the third concerto, which in some ways it's the most famous because the opening theme with those scales, they come up and just the way the opening theme works, everyone says, oh yes, I know that. Yes. And what's really interesting is if you continue, if you play just three more bars and stop it. Okay. Now, how does he start the cadenza? And it works it backwards. It's like, I always find that A flat because you really don't expect the cadenza to start like that after the- No, you don't. Yeah, and it's so powerful, it's so dramatic. And then you go back and you go, ah, he's, he's hinted at this harmony before. When you expect C, very often you actually get the A flat in the bass. So, okay, so we have this incredible opening uh, to, to the cadenza, which is very, very powerful. And he actually marks a dynamic, which he doesn't always do in cadenzas, does he? I mean, right. Quite often cadenzas go from pages without any dynamic. It's a and one, one should mention that Beethoven's one of the composers who writes a lot of indications in his scores. He likes to put, well, he likes to tell us what to do. And so to have this sort of freedom not to have anything in the cadenzas or this uncertainty is rather shocking. It's a bigger shock than in other cases. Yeah, that's a very interesting point because he was also, he decided he was so frustrated that people didn't play his music in the same tempo and the tempo he wanted that he ended up putting metronome markings on many many of his pieces which of course is a whole other discussion how does he develop then this this cadenza take us through it well he takes this basic theme that, that i've just played here's the a flat He's again taking it, transforming it, moving it, taking an idea, and then putting it into a different dimension. Okay, so you've got this fantastic canon, and then, okay, let's have some virtuosity, is what he's basically saying. Absolutely. And the virtuosity is amazing because it's just a harmonic progression. If you just... Simple, but it's transformed into something absolutely massive. making it really big and this is where I think what people associate with Beethoven sound on the piano that these are sort of uh, trademark moments that you have this idea of wow, so huge resonating every every note is, is ringing on the piano. Incredible flourishes really is, is yeah. really, and, and I often think how sad that Beethoven couldn't have heard you play on that piano or couldn't himself have played on a piano like that because as great as it would have sounded in Beethoven's day on his own piano uh, these modern pianos had just, it's incredible, the power, and I get the privilege to, to stand right next to it, you know, night after night, very often. Okay, so he, he takes us through these fantastic, all these different keys and all these flourishes, and, um, and then we come to a passage where he has to create a bridge, right? We go again into a kind of chromaticism and, and trills, as you mentioned earlier. Absolutely. Both, and as a matter of fact, don't we? Beautiful second theme that we love too. One of the things that really fascinates me about that second theme is what the key that it's in. Because I think when it, you've heard it twice before, right? It's first, I think it's in E flat, and then it's in C major earlier in the piece when it comes Perfect. into the recap. And now somehow in G major, it sounds so free, like you've taken it into its own realm. And I'm sure you feel that when you play it, like you're in another world. It is. And I think. A big thing also of making those magical moments and how Beethoven could achieve them was by having all that drama before. So it, this contrast gives you that impression because it was so big. So as I was explaining, the whole piano is resonating and then we have this very 
pure and elemental and beautiful melody once again. Absolutely. <laughs> Here he starts playing with it, really, because oh. that was just a presentation, right? Let the left hand suddenly now. Yeah. And then here he goes crazy. <laughs> Incredible. But, and of course, then he takes that beautiful theme which you'd heard in, 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 a, in the major key of G, and he, and he gives it to you in C minor. Um, and we'd never heard that theme in, in that kind of dark color before. So it, and the tension that increases as you, as you played it just now is, is incredible. And then suddenly you're in this F minor and you have this phenomenal passage of virtuosity, which- Which leads to back to theme number one. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> Whenever I stand next to a pianist and they're playing all this with the octaves, um, I, I'm always just so incredibly impressed. Is, is that hard? This part isn't that hard. <laughs> I, honestly, it really is one of those moments that it feels like somebody's really you know, like jumping off a cliff and flying to me. It's just so dramatic. Okay, so we have that fantastic passage. Um, and then tell us how he brings us into the end. He, he uses, once again, two of the most important methods of switching moods and keys, a chromatic seal and trills. because we have this dominant, this G major chord, this five that, that we're supposed to go use, but it's juxtaposed by A flat chord and just this um, constant tug of war between the two and he uses that tug of war because it's just in the trill, it's that part is fine. This trill is not so easy. quite yet already. That is an unusual thing where you've got three note trills, right? That, as, you have, as you were just playing. That's, quite, that's not so common. Maybe later. Well, it's common. And it's hard enough to do two note trills in one hand, but then to add the second and to make sure that, you know, they don't start going. It has to be together. And that, that part is the most challenging. The passage that just precedes that always fascinates me because again, he just did. And it's just the second bar. He leaves out pom pom, bim ba pom pom. There's a second bar, the second bar, the second bar. So he, he it's like the, the way he deals with the material and transforms it from one character to another is just incredible. Now the final trills are always kind of interesting as well because it's not so common, uh, especially up to this point, that you would have uh, uh, trills that change. Cool. Yeah, change, and they change in chromatic, once again, progression, so he's using both methods at the same time. Strange, right? What, what are we at here? Well, that's also remarkable. I mean, it's a, it, you, you, it becomes a C 
dominant ninth chord, actually. That was pretty revolutionary. Let's now hear the cadenza of the third concerto. <laughs> Wonderful, Jan. Okay, this is incredible. Now we're on to the fourth concerto. Now this is a very, very unusual experience, right? The fourth concerto starts, I mean, the fifth concerto starts in an unusual way as well. But um, let's see, the fourth concerto, we, usually we'd be standing there waiting for the orchestra to play a tutti. It's one of the most challenging beginnings there is of any piece, of any concerto most definitely. Because you start with a G major chord, uh, plays, we have eight notes at the same time together, and then it continues with the main theme, but it has to be intense and soft. Uh, I mean, Beethoven himself marks piano and dolce, but it also has to somehow bring in the orchestra. So it's this combination because it's not a cadenza. This is not a place to, to do whatever you want. It's not, not a, a passage to take your time, to dilly-daddle, to imagine things. It has to give the piece some structure. It gives it a foundation. You have to somehow create this feeling of peace, of calm. And it, it's, when it works, it's magical. When it doesn't, it's a little bit different. I've, I've been on stage with you, and it's always been magical. Thank you. <laughs> 
And you can see me taking a deep breath. That's the only way to make it work. Because if, if you don't, it's really easy to put a chord together on a piano. And we're going off on a tangent, but this is interesting. If you put a chord together on a piano, big is easy because you put all the uh, hammers and the mechanics all work when it's loud, when you're going quickly. But to make it soft and to make it accurate and to voice it the way you want to, that's much more challenging. So take that deep breath and exhale when you're playing in the middle. Now what happens is magical, isn't it? What, what, what do you get to do? Well, that's, suddenly we play what seems like the same notes, but in a very different key. You do. Let's hear it. But the way he moves himself back from B ultimately to the G uh, is just incredibly beautiful. It's so yeah. elegant. It's almost, it, he presents the main theme, but isn't, doesn't it almost feel a little bit like it's uh, sort of a prelude to, to what's about the beginning? It's not, we, we don't, I often feel when I'm playing this piece that, that it's sort of getting into the work. It's not, not a core part of it somehow. It's finding itself, even from the point of view of tempo as well, it should never feel really metronomic until we get to that moment, when then you get this. And to, to get that tempo from the very beginning, <laughs> it's a big challenge, isn't it, from, from that spot? Absolutely. But I think, you know, if we play with freedom, but with respect to the fact that it's a classical piece and we shouldn't overindulge, then when we find that tempo, it, and it, ah, it's like a beautiful release. And we it know is. we're now on a, on a journey after. So it starts with a contemplation, is what is so beautiful about this piece. It is. So, that, so that's the first theme, and it, it's absolutely fascinating that he doesn't, because he's already given you that, the cadenza doesn't really start like that at all. Not really, no. I mean, first of all, it starts in a different uh, time signature. It's 6-8 versus common time. So very has, unusual. Very unusual and has this um, urgency to it right away. Because from a very strict common time, 4-4, four, four, very square, and normal to, to sort of shifting it a little bit. But using the same basic thematic material, but of course in 6-8, so it makes it completely different. so forth and and again this sort of feels like a bit of a introduction to the cadenza doesn't it okay so then he gives us a, a left hand with a classic kind of six eight left hand in the sixteenths as it builds up and then brings us to a scale absolutely and we have a, a rhythmic device called a quignola here which gives us another sort of change in the mood because we suddenly have instead of we're used to and here suddenly we have where it should be. So it, it throws us off once again and then goes into this passage. That's wonderful. And the, the hemiolo, of course, usually it's divided one, two, three, one, two, three. Exactly. So the six, eight bar hemiolo is one, two, one, two, one, two. Ba -da, ba -da, ba -da. That's, what, that's what you're referring to when you say that. So the first time we heard the second theme would be. In the orchestral part, of course. And it's used significantly throughout the concerto, but here we have it. Okay, so now we get a little bit of interesting rhythmic stuff and virtuosity entering the picture. Let's hear a little bit. Of 
Wonderful. Be flat major suddenly. <laughs> Absolutely. But then he's going to use uh, his usual scale arpeggio and trills to take us into a complete, actually in a way back to a world which we kind of visited at the beginning. I find this passage very interesting that you kind of go back um, even rhythmically to the beginning of the cadenza, which you don't almost ever hear in a cadenza. No, you don't. And it, and it switches time signatures from bar to bar. And it's this sort of huge contrast, which uh, I'll play it first, and I think we, maybe we'll discuss it after. So. Okay. okay. of the first theme. It's taken so far away from what we've heard at the very beginning. It's amazing. It's a phenomenal imagination and, and invention. Uh, and hard to imagine that somebody could have sat down and improvised such a brilliant cadenza, but maybe Beethoven had that capacity. Yeah. I mean, it's quite probably, one has to believe it. <laughs> one has to believe it, absolutely. The next event is, is quite interesting, isn't it? Because he get, then again goes from the 6-8 the one, two, three, four, five, six, into yeah. a standard four, four. That's but not for long. <laughs> that, to, to, for me, this is possibly the most important theme, oddly enough, that's maybe sort of strange thing to say, because the way it's presented, both in forte in the orchestra, but in these beautiful piano moments, twice in the main body of the movement, is two of the most stunning moments. And then- At the end of my solos, right? At the end of the exposition and then at the end of the recapitulation. And, and the way he uses it, Absolutely, yeah, just opens the door to the wildness. And, and the way he uses it in the cadenza at this moment is phenomenal. And then, of course, it's also going to be the theme with which the orchestra returns uh, to, to accompany you at, at the very end of the cadenza. And now so, we have this amazing struggle between this beautiful and, and idyllic utopian theme and uh, what we've heard at the beginning. Dun, 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 da, da, da. <laughs> souvenir of it but but I almost think it, it's almost alluding to, to what comes in the second movement though we're not talking about it but we have this uh, Dante and, like the, the contrast between the orchestra and the piano this is sort of the same this this drastic fight between two opposing forces that we have Absolutely. Here living in really in two worlds it's also what, what you just played is a wonderful example of variation then I mean, that kind of ornamentation uh, in the hands of Beethoven is just so, so extraordinary. Do you mind just playing it one more time so we can hear that? Incredible, yeah. Tell us how you feel about the, the end of this particular cadenza, because it's a little bit unusual, huh? So he takes his theme and he, he makes it quicker and quicker and more intense. Trill, after a big virtuoso passage.
now the orchestra comes in here, I don't have a feeling like it's the end of the cadenza quite yet. It's almost like a continuation, and also harmonically, because we haven't resolved it yet. We're still working. We're working on that resolution. We haven't quite figured it out. Is it incredible? Ma absolutely magical. Yeah. Beautiful, Jan. Thank you so much.
Well, that's absolutely exquisite. What a, what a wonderful cadenza, beautiful playing as always. Let's go to the fifth concerto because it's maybe the, one of the very interesting things about the fifth concerto is that it doesn't have a real cadenza, right? Exactly. And I think this is the sort of progression we've heard in these concertos. We heard the second concerto, so the first one written, very traditional cadenza, imp improvisatory, but, but not too crazy. Great Beethoven writing. Then we had the, the first concerto cadenza, very also very improvisational, but of course expanded and insane in its duration, as we spoke about, but still fairly traditional in, in how it structures things and how it ends. Then we have the third, which already ends quite unusually, leads us with peculiar key, as we've discussed. And we have the fourth, which doesn't really end. And now we have a fifth, which just doesn't have a cadenza at all. It just has passages, but, but it doesn't have this structure necessarily. But at the same time, the first minute and a half of the piece doesn't have an orchestral tutti either. It just has essentially chords. No, and I think this is the nickname, I mean, Emperor, this is where you can really hear it the most, isn't it? Because you have this feeling that it just like, whoa, and starts, it begins. Here we are, complete opposite from the fourth concerto that we were discussing, so quiet and so close and so, so intimate. And here we have this just grander, oh yes, this, this is me, this is confidence. And we're working on an E flat major chord. That's all we do, right? Absolutely. I mean, the nobility of this is just incredible. And the first chord is, is nothing shy. It's, it's most of just the whole orchestra, actually, and in fortissima. Exactly. And after counting four, uh, I come in. Major, you're once again with me on that. <laughs> right. Incredible. I mean, people must have thought, I don't know what, when they first heard this concerto, because they were already shocked with the fourth, but it's had that very introspective feeling. All, all of a sudden, here you're expecting some massive tutti, you get a big E flat chord, but then nothing happens, and suddenly the piano comes in and the orchestra stops. And it's still shocking today. And so then you have another one. Okay, do you want to give us the A flat chord? Here we go. which is B flat five seven. And once again, four beats and I continue. Finally, the orchestra comes in and actually but, plays the theme. Yeah. Exactly, that's, a, that's an interesting thing. We haven't heard any thematic material, have we, so far? The only thing I could ever work out in this is it's a little bit like that. That theme later, can yeah. each one of them sort of ends with that or it appears in various places. But otherwise, it's, it's just whatever he feels like in terms of scales and different shapes uh, and some trills. It's, it's very spontaneous. I think it must be incredible is it very exciting to, to, to play these opening it is I can it is. I think, Peter would you agree that the time it occurs once again in the recapitulation is a little more exciting for you too for sure <laughs> because yeah. you have this, this drastic scale at the end of the last passage that instead of ending nicely as it just did now even we have this chromatic scale that you have to come in and it's a different material, isn't it? Absolutely. Want to play it? <laughs> I feel it, but if the conductor feels it, it's a completely different question. Yeah. Well, you know, those moments, 
if you've got a pianist who's got really amazing rhythm in their head, you use your ear and you watch them very carefully. And you also have usually fabulous orchestral musicians who also know exactly when to come in. But it is one of those moments where when you come in and it's perfect, it feels it's very great. good. But if it's not, then it, it's yeah. very noticeable. Yeah, you, got, you can have the next night. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thank you so much for talking us through these cadenzas. And um, it, it obviously, we were so looking forward to having you in Boulder to play all five Beethoven concerti. I hope very much you'll return uh, to, to be with us when everything is back to normal. Uh, and everybody will so look forward to, to meeting you and, and hearing you perform. But in the meantime, this was absolutely fascinating. And I think, you know, it was a great opportunity to get inside your head and see what you might be thinking about all these cadenzas. So, thank, thank you, Peter. Thank you for your time. I wish everybody a lot of health and happiness, and I hope that we meet in that concert hall very soon when we all feel safe to be in one. So wish you a good time in the meantime and enjoy music. Thank you so much. Great. Well, there you have it. What a warm and generous person. Despite having been a child prodigy and having performed from an extremely young age with the wisdom of a mature artist with incredible technical capacity and to constant accolades, he remains the kindest and most empathetic human being one could ever imagine. I hope you enjoyed getting to know him in the intimate setting of his own home.